people have always preferred this notion of instant gratification. I need something and I need it now. In today's world, the way you order a movie is obviously instant, the way you order music is obviously instant. And related to that, more content is being consumed, not less. The media now are actually the individuals. An increasing number of people share information and share stories of their realities in a far less mediated way than before. We have the freedom, we have the power of choice. So really, the viewer is in control. With that control comes a responsibility. This is why curation is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. You have like different layers responsible for how information is curated right now. So for instance, what is the role of all algorithms, how information is actually curated by machines through social profiling. Some news organizations think that the future is almost completely algorithmic. I think human judgment is still going to really matter. Consumers have a lot more agency. They're no longer just passive receivers of goods and services and of content. We describe something we call the participation scale. Now at the bottom of that scale is consumption. The next step is sharing other people's content or ideas. Above that is what we call shaping. That's where people take an idea and remix it. The next level is funding, contributing to making a product possible. The next step is producing. At the top of the participation scale is co-ownership. Anyone who claims that digital is dumbing down everything should look at pure digital plays like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Particularly in scripted television, there's more quality today than there's ever been. You need to think about all the different platforms. Vine is very different than Snapchat, than what it is on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. It's not a battle between one versus the other. Advertisers need to recognize that the model has changed from buying product loyalty to earning product loyalty, and that requires engagement. We trusted church, state, government. And then we went into the heady days of the 50s and 60s where everybody went brand crazy. We kind of accepted that those institutions were there and we, and we consumed. The fundamental shift today in light of digital is that people now trust people. They trust each other's reviews on things like TripAdvisor, on eBay, on Amazon. I don't need to believe anything anymore because it has a user rating of 4.6. So the fascinating thing for brands now is how do you become a valuable part of the dialogue? People are looking for more relevant content in every form. So on the one hand, we're seeing programmatic advertising happening where we're getting far more targeted adverts being positioned to the user. On the consumer behavior side, consumers are blocking adverts. At the moment, most digital advertising is not a pleasure. The quality of the ads, the relevance of the ads is very low, and they're, frankly, a pretty annoying, unpleasant user experience. So what do we do? We've got two options. We either make our ads more relevant, or we start doing omni-channel marketing. So if we can give people value for attention, then that's an economic exchange that doesn't need to be explicitly stated, it's implicitly experienced. But you also need to engage with your consumers and let them have input into your product development. Xiaomi is a Chinese manufacturer. They have a massive online community which they get all the input in terms of product development from and then they sell only through online channels. So they've disrupted the channel rather than the technology itself. Young people, they see participation as almost an inalienable right. So you need to build a crowd in support of what you do. You need to build your own constituency. The role in that narrative isn't chuck them an ad in the middle of their social media. It requires a very different model for how you engage with the consumer. How can you add something valuable to the consumer's experience? Young people who are coming of age today, all they want to do is be connected. Being connected to information and the connection to people. And that constant sense of connection is both empowering and utterly confusing. Generation K is living in anxiety, but on the other hand, shows a lot of compassion. But people mistake compassion with empathy. We are creatures that are meant to talk and are meant to develop empathy with each other when we do. College students show a 40% decline in every way we know how to measure empathy in the past 20 years. There's nothing wrong with our devices, but the way we're using them is hurting empathy, intimacy, and in the workplace, significant collaboration and creativity. I think more and more companies are realizing that they're paying a price for the empathy gap. 
we are ready to witness the rebirth of the physical world. People are going to start thinking about, do I really want to sit here behind a computer screen making friends or do I want to make some real friends? The human strikes back to say, actually I don't need 600 friends, six good friends is fine. The trick here is to step back, to recognize that we're not in a virtuous circle, we're in a vicious circle, and to design for our vulnerability to this technology we can create these places for conversation and business. We can create work cultures where it's not going to be rewarded to sit in your office and be the pilot in the cockpit. One of the concerns with social media is the sheer disposability of human experience. Something happens, it's gone in an instant. Humanity will probably start hungering for a degree of permanence, a degree of something that lasts a little bit longer. But I think humanity fundamentally is a lot stronger than digital media. Why are people sharing data? By choice, by circumstance, or by coercion. By choice are all of the folks who realize that if they share information, they get something back. At the moment, I give my data to Google. Google gives me some search services. And that's absolutely fine, because the worst that happens, I get an ad that's targeted at me and is targeted at my behavior. At the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, you have people who have their data taken away from them over and over again without any ability to consent to this. Most people live in a world of data by circumstance. They just want to talk to their friends on Instagram. They want it to not be a big deal. And what they really hope is that they won't get screwed on the other end. But I don't actually know the worth of my data. What am I worth to Google? And that's where the issue of transparency and value exchange starts to become really interesting. We're at a cusp moment on some of the questions about privacy and permanence. People are moving to small group messaging versus sort of very public. So those are signs that people are concerned about their sort of digital fingerprint. At the same time, I think there are gaps in that still. At some point, somebody is going to abuse our data in such a way that it suddenly highlights it. And people will start to say, hang on, you're not allowed to know that stuff about me. Most people have no power in this ecosystem. Their only power is the possibility of walking away, and that means walking away from their friends, walking away from information ecosystems. Staying online is a way of giving ourselves the feeling that we can be in control of the too much data that's coming in. But we're, we're kidding ourselves. We've got filter bubbles where we're exposed to things that are algorithmically selected for us and that tend to reinforce our existing belief systems, wants and desires. Old media made it far more likely that we would serendipitously encounter ideas that could be good for us. Children who have a mobile device frame their self-identity in a completely different way than the previous generation. They make friends in the digital media, learn and play through the digital media. Having a converging between the physical world and digital world, the way they actually interact and see themselves will be completely different. They have a much more bigger world they can explore, bigger horizon, bigger opportunities, and bigger freedom. People have really begun to debate what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages of ever younger children getting access to digital media. Parents are worrying, teachers are worrying, but they have no other choice but putting them on a digital media. It is not about technology. It is about the trust between the children and parents. If the parents have themselves invested in understanding digital media, then that really benefits their kids. And if parents themselves don't really understand it, they tend to just kind of make rules, and it tends to lead the children to go away and use the media where their parents can't see them. We have to teach children and from the very young age. Whatever they say, whatever they play in a digital world can have an explicit and tangible impact on the physical world. The findings from behavioral and brain sciences need to be used to better understand how attention, memory, perception work in kids and provide them with something that is tailored to them. A wealth of knowledge is at everyone's fingertips. That kind of changes the skills that children need. We're in an age where what matters is the image. We can reach children more through their visual imagination, so that means we can reach them younger. A lot of kids at school no longer learn poems, they learn how to search information online. It isn't about finding the one book, it's about knowing how to select from a wealth of resources. The negative side of this is impatience. We are incredibly distracted. Our attention is spread quite thinly. Is it possible that that could have an impact on our ability to attend to, to focus, to imagine? Health has become a behavioral issue. We need to change people's behavior. The future belongs to those who are going to use digital media in order to transform information into knowledge and to positively influence people's behavior.
we see job opportunities in the freelance and gig economies in roles that you wouldn't have been able to previously see 15, 20 years ago. Anything from marketing to executive roles to medical. The workplace has become somewhat borderless. We are no longer constrained by the walls of an office. We can work at any time, anywhere. Tied to that is also the globalization and equalization opportunities that that kind of workforce can allow. How much better would it be for me to leverage a platform to access the world's best talent, regardless of where that talent is, where the work is, and when I need to get that work done. Younger people are asking for more flexibility. Companies that are able to provide that flexibility will be more successful at attracting top talent. There's really no need why you should be looking only at you know, the 10 mile radius that traditional companies were looking at. The benefits of what digitization have allowed for the workplace can also be a downfall if you don't manage it properly. And that means both the employee managing it and the employer. I emphasize to people to really make sure they have clear boundaries for themselves. And they do turn off and they're fairly honest with themselves so they don't let it creep into their lives and be nonstop. It's not just are you a great developer or are you a really good writer, but it's also can you market yourself and can you sell yourself. One of the reasons why this resonates so well with the millennial generation is because that's what they do anyway. When you've been participating in social networks all your life, this makes perfect sense for them to do this with their professional life as well. In a global economy where the pace of change is orders of magnitude greater than what it has been in the past, individuals need to reskill themselves many different times. In a world that is going to be short of talent, those with the right skills will have many choices and if they don't feel that they make enough progress and gain enough knowledge they will choose to work elsewhere so how as an employer you engage with the talent with the right skills is going to be extremely important in the generations coming up people are going to be retired and then they're going to be still very active intellectually and physically for another 20 30 years and I think what you'll see again is this notion of more flexible remote freelance type of work the successful leaders of tomorrow are the ones who are going to be able to say is it best for me to hire someone? Should I offshore the work? Should I use a platform like a top coder? The winning organizations of tomorrow will be the ones who have a business model that allows to seamlessly traverse all of those options and continually move work in a way that best meets their needs. The primary driver of civic participation in any community is need. You do it because you see a gap and you need to address it. The secondary driver is a type of moral concern, the sense of global citizenship that characterizes many millennials. The three-year-old Syrian boy Ayan Kurdi who drowned generated such an enormous outpouring of public grief that within hours hundreds of thousands of people had signed a petition to put pressure on the Prime Minister whether or not people felt comfortable about that image being shared so widely. It has the potential to change policy. But most of the time there's that nagging suspicion that most people don't feel very connected to the issues they care about. For example, signing a petition, donating money, are not particularly meaningful actually in terms of supporting frontline activists on the ground. What we're trying to do there is think about civic participation in a much more individualized way. Tap into the potential of these distributed networks that really characterize modern day activism and are enabled by technology trends that come out of consumer markets, so live video, uh, task routing APIs from the on-demand economy, smart calendaring, and say, why not make sure that's the tool you use to connect you to the civic participation that you care about. There is now quite a rise of um, people who call themselves digital humanitarians and this is I think a very interesting space where you could see social media being very productive in humanitarian relief efforts. Civil society experiment with new forms of participation. Governments should embrace this experimentation as well, because if governments do not do that, it will happen just like the music industry. Innovation will be made in spite of that.